This is a production of Cornell University. So, hello, I'm uh, Michael Mazurik, and I have the, the pleasure of introducing today's uh, special seminar speaker, Kristen Loria, who will be presenting uh, for her master's uh, thesis defense. Um, and so Kristen uh, actually got her bachelor's in natural resources uh, here at Cornell. And from there, uh, went on a variety of uh, farming and farm advocacy adventures, um, working at uh, Farm Hack, among others. Um, but it was her time at Sparrowbush Farm that kindled uh, a real love, you'll see in today's talk, for, for beans and dry beans. Um, from there, uh, she then went to Wisconsin-Madison uh, for a year. Uh, working uh, with Erwin Goldman and his group there before uh, I was lucky to recruit her uh, to Cornell uh, to do her master's uh, research uh, with me on uh, uh, vegetable trialing uh, and breeding for sustainable systems. And was really lucky in Kristen's uh, time with us, uh, not only uh, did she get to do a balance of many uh, activities from uh, working in extension uh, related aspects to pathology, uh, variety trialing um, and breeding, but she helped us uh, get started on uh, the dry bean breeding aspects of our research program. And that's gonna be something uh, that we'll uh, look forward to remaining connected with Kristen uh, for years to come and also will be reaping the benefits from uh, those systems that she helped us set up. Um, and so I'm uh, very glad uh, to turn it over to, to Kristen today, um, who will uh, share about her work in dry beans. Okay, great. Thanks, Michael, for that introduction. Um, and so I'll be speaking today about two different projects that revolve generally around genetic improvement of dry bean within the context of regional food systems. So I'll start off with a little bit of background on dry bean production here in the Northeast, as I suspect many of you are not super familiar with this crop, and also some background on common bean diversity generally. So um, common bean underwent two parallel domestications that continue to define modern market classes. Each gene pool is subdivided into three races with distinct adaptive characteristics originating in contrasting environments of the center of origin. For example, race Durango is adapted to hot and arid environments, while race Mesoamerica is adapted to the humid lowlands of Central America. Greatly reduced diversity within modern market classes compared to broader domesticated gene pools has, increased, has increasingly been cited as an obst obstacle to genetic improvement, particularly in Andean germplasm. Only some of bean races are represented by modern market classes and crossing between gene pools and even races is relatively uncommon in modern bean breeding due to strict market class definitions, as well as some issues of autoimmune related hybrid inviability that occurs between some intergene pool crosses. These factors have limited movement of adaptive traits between modern market classes. Moving on to some background on dry bean production in New York State, Though a substantial amount of dry beans are still grown here, it was once a major crop for our region with much more widespread production. Common bean has been grown in what is now the Northeastern United Sta States since before European settlement and continues to be an important cultural and subsistence crop for indigenous communities of our region. After settlement, New York State was the largest bean producing state prior to the 19th century. In 1909, 115,000 acres were grown on just a, over 21,000 farms just in New York. At the time, primarily navy beans, which were then called pea beans, were grown in addition to kidneys, yellow eyes, 
and a small amount of black turtle. There was also still widespread cultivation of other traditional varieties, and many different strains of varieties were grown in different regions of the state for unique environments or markets. Most modern cultivars have their origins in these traditional and land race bean varieties, either associated with indigenous communities brought by European settlers or a combination of the two. Varieties brought by European settlers frequently had their origins in early colonization of South America. And one hypothesis for how Andean germplasm from South America reached the Northeast is via early visitation from Europe to North America. Other hypotheses have posited that Andean germplasm may have reached North America via the Caribbean. In comparison to that impressive acreage and number of bean growers back in 1909, today just 12,619 acres of dry beans were grown on 91 farms in 2017 in the state of New York. This is compared to 282,000 acres of soybeans grown on over 2,000 farms. This decline has complex economic, demographic, and agronomic causes but has been attributed in part to outbreaks of bean common mosaic virus and root rots in the early 20th century, as well as the rapid expansion of cheap agricultural land in Western regions after World War I, which was purchased by soldiers who supposedly had a newfound taste for dry beans that they developed in the military. However, it appears that beans may once again be making a comeback in New York. Recent figures demonstrate increasing production in the state with 2019 figures representing an increase over just 9,600 acres in 2012. Organic production is increasing faster than conventional, likely result, the result of high demand for organic products generally and a significant price premium available for organically grown beans. Still, the majority of dry bean production today occurs in other regions, with the highest producing states being North Dakota, Michigan, Nebraska, and Minnesota. While Washington and Idaho have arid climates reducing some issues of foliar pathogens that trouble the Northeast, states such as Michigan or Minnesota have similar climate to the Northeast, resulting in useful overlap of breeding priorities and potential for collaboration. So different production regions across the United States tend to specialize in a subset of market classes. Here in New York, nearly all acreage is devoted to black, dark red kidney, and light red kidney market classes. The majority of this crop is sold to a few processors and subsequently to canneries, which is a highly consolidated industry. Here in New York, we only have one cannery left in Angola, New York and nearly all growers in New York buy certified seed from Western states, which has been an effective strategy in reducing levels of seed-borne disease. Canning quality is a trait of top importance in commodity dry bean programs due to the stringent quality requirements imposed by bean canneries. Canning quality is both a complex trait and is costly to phenotype and has been cited as an obstacle to genetic improvement by incentivizing narrow crosses within elite cultivars that already possess good canning quality. Other high priority traits include yield, upright growth habit, and white mold resistance. As a food legume, dry beans are a high value complement to small grains, forage, and fodder systems that excel within many environments of the Northeast. More diverse cropping systems have been shown to increase yields and profitability, particularly in organic systems. As a source of plant protein, dry beans offer a tasty, nutritious, and beautiful source of sustenance for consumers. Breeding and market development efforts for small grains have been initiated in the past 10 years to explicitly increase demand and rebuild supply chains for regionally grown grains, 
but parallel efforts in pulse crops have lagged behind. While most dry bean acreage in New York is still devoted to black and kidney market classes, some producers and processors are expanding into market classes that have not been grown in the state in recent decades, but that appear to be well suited for our production environment. Data from 2020 trials at Geneva indicate that such alternative classes, such as Great Northern, Navy, Yellow, um, and not so much cranberry, can perform just as well or better than black or kidney market classes. Due to breeding advancements, many of these market cl classes, which are widely grown in other reg regions of the country, increase increasingly possess an upright, indeterminate growth habit that is required for direct harvest, a trait that was previously predominantly limited to black bean market class. Progress in disease resistance breeding has also improved performance in temperate regions such as the Northeast. Opportunities for increased regional production include proximity to population centers of the East Coast, increased consumer interest in buying local or regional products, and the productivity of alternative market classes um, as shown in preliminary yield trials. However, challenges remain, such as the loss of generational knowledge for producing dry beans in our region, the loss of many regional processors and other supply chain actors, the loss of uh, specialized bean equipment when needed, and also the limited capacity of many farmers to process or handle dry beans on their own farms. Central to the effort of supporting regional agriculture from the perspective of a plant breeder is engagement with diverse stakeholder needs of key actors in the food system and prioritization of traits of importance to each of these actors. Some traits, of course, overlap. These traits include agronomic traits that are high priority for growers, culinary and nutritional traits for consumers, and general food system sustainability priorities that we all share, such as resource use efficiency, and pest resistance, for example, that reduces the need for chemical controls. Notably, you may note that this table does not include canning quality, which as I mentioned, is a difficult trait to breed for and phenotype for. Because a higher percentage of regional dry bean sales go to dry packed markets, the ability to deprioritize canning quality in favor of other traits may be a substantial advantage in making breeding progress. So that wraps up the dry bean crash course. <laughs> um, and first um, is a project funded by a SARE graduate student grant to explore intra-varietal diversity of the Jacobs cattle bean within decentralized seed saving networks. Jacob's cattle is a widely grown traditional variety whose specific origins are somewhat unclear, but that has a long history in the Northeast and particularly in New England. So first, traditional varieties offer potentially useful traits for diversification and improvement of modern bean varieties, but have long been underutilized. This untapped potential has led to an increase in traditional and land raised variety trials being conducted both here in our breeding program and other bean breeding programs in the United States as well as globally. Traditional varieties are increasingly being considered for unique traits that may have been overlooked in the past, including nitrogen fixing ability, yield under low input conditions, novel seed coat colors and patterns, and unique culinary qualities. To determine the suitability of traditional varieties for modern bean improvement, these varieties are increasingly the subject of genetic diversity studies, such as this one by Wilker et al. These studies indicate that heirloom varieties do offer a potential source of novel genetic diversity not present in modern cultivars, and also offer potentially useful traits, particularly for breeding in organic or low input systems. 
In the figure on the left, we see that heirloom varieties span both gene pools and offer many novel seed traits that are not represented in modern cultivars. As with modern cultivars, heirloom beans can typically be assigned to a single center of origin and or race, as I had described earlier in the background. Um, but some varieties show evidence of gene pool admixture. This is especially common among traditional varieties of Europe. Oops, in the figure to the right here, the single red point in the center of the principal component plot show evidence of gene pool admixture. Interestingly, that same variety also showed the highest nitri nit nitrogen fixation ability within uh, heirloom germplasm evaluated in the Wilker study. In results from variety trials conducted on certified organic land by our program in 2019 and 2020, and you see here results from the 2019 trial, higher values are represented by a green background on the plot. As you can see, some non-commercial varieties such as Candy, Stardust, and Jacob's Cattle Gold demonstrated yield performance as good or better than the commercial cultivars which are indicated by black boxes. This demonstrates potential for these varieties to be grown successfully at a commercial scale, as well as integrated into breeding programs. These results align with similar, um, other similar trials, which show some traditional varieties to be competitive with modern cultivars and others that are not. So first, um, it's probably a good idea to define what exactly an heirloom variety, or in this case, heirloom bean is. Um, we also, and I probably will refer, this, refer to this as a traditional variety as well. Um, and we can define this as a population variety cultivated for many generations with origins in land races, formally released cultivars, or both. And these variety trials that we were conducting in 2019 um, brought to the forefront a question. Given the obscure history of most heirloom bean varieties, when incorporating this material into trialing and breeding efforts, how much does seed source of that variety matter? So that inspired this case study. And we hope to determine whether seed source was associated with significant genetic or phenotypic divergence. Related to that divergence, we also wanted to explore different modes of germplasm conservation, namely comparing our formal germplasm system, the grain collection, to decentralized informal seed saving and selling networks. And finally, we hope to determine what the source of genetic diversity might have been in these seed sources. So through a collaboration with Seed Savers Exchange, which is a nonprofit with a long history of stewarding heritage varieties and connecting seed savers, we first identified diverse sources of Jacob's cattle via their seed exchange listings, which are primarily listed by home gardeners. We also identified other sources within bean seed saver networks in New England, a potential secondary center for the Jacobs cattle bean with roots in indigenous cultivation in the region. Finally, we identified sources within small farm-based seed companies throughout the north, northern sector of the United States, as well as in Nova Scotia. In general, we attempted to obtain seed sources that had been grown in distinct environments for a number of years. 18 sources were ultimately obtained and included in the study, originating primarily, again, in the northern portion of the United States and southern Canada. Some have distinct strain names, but were generally, generally defined as being associated with Jacob's cattle. Some seed sources have been saved by a single grower in a single location for as many as 30 years, and some for much less time. We also obtained seed from five sources of a commercial kidney to serve as a check. And finally, 
researchers at the University of Minnesota shared unpublished sequence data from a study of four other heirloom bean varieties with 20 individuals from a single seed source genotyped for each variety. This data allowed us to compare diversity with single seed sources within sources between Jacob's cattle and other heirloom varieties, providing valuable context for our data. And those are the strain names. Four individual plants from each seed source were genotyped using genotyping by sequencing, or GBS. We obtained 150 base pair paired end reads using an APKI digest. The sequence data was then pooled with the University of Minnesota data, um, thanks to Dr. Tom Michaels and Dr. Hannah Sweetgarden, and downstream analysis was conducted as a single batch. Reads were aligned to the Fasiolus vulgaris genome version 2.1. SNPs were called in tassel and filtered using VCF tools. Filter parameters were 5% minor allele frequency, maximum missing of 60%, and a depth range of 3 to 30. Population genetic analysis was done in R using various packages. Second, field phenotyping was conducted in summer 2020. We used an augmented design with four blocks and two replications. Data was collected on morphological traits that are previously correlated with genetic diversity in common bean. A secondary goal of growing the seed sources in a common garden experiment such as this was to harvest seed from all sources, bulk that seed and redistribute it back to participating seed savers um, that sent us seed um, which would increase genetic variance um, for each seed savers population and allow for subsequent selection and readaptation to their environment. So diving right into results, a principal component analysis of Jacob's cattle seed sources, along with our single sources of those four other heirloom varieties and our commercial checks confirm the center of origin for the heirloom varieties included in the study and demonstrates genetic divergence of a subset of Jacob's cattle seed sources. So as with previous principal components shown, we see um, typically principal component one defining Andean versus Middle American clusters quite clearly. So overall, Jacob's cattle sources shown by green plus marks and circled in a black circle, show more divergence along both principal components compared to other varieties with fewer sources, including our five sources of the commercial kidney, shown here by an orange triangle, and single sources of four other heirloom bean varieties. Single black and pinto genotypes were included to contextualize gene pool clustering, and so are shown towards the right of the plot by a red circle and purple crossed box, respectively. We see that all heirloom varieties included appeared to be of Andean origin, with the exception of Pregian, which appears to be of Middle American origin, likely race Mesoamerica. To give some context for this intravarietal divergence, some Jacobs cattle sources appear to diverge more than distinct varieties, suggesting substantial genetic variation between sources. In particular, one seed source circled in red demonstrates relatively large divergence across the, principal, the first principal component, which is associated with gene pool assignment. So zooming into a principal component of Jacob's cattle seed sources only, we can see more clearly here that 14 of those 18 sources circled in black tightly cluster in the lower left of the plot, while four sources show significant divergence. One in particular circled in red that we noted in the last plot shows a much higher divergence across principal component one than other sources. 
Next, we conducted a discriminant analysis of principal components to assign genetic cluster to seed source. Genetic data are first transformed using principal component analysis into components that explain most genetic variation. These components are then used to perform a linear discriminant analysis, which minimizes genetic variation within populations while maximizing among population variation. This method is useful in the context of our case study, as it does not require assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg or linkage disequilibrium, as a structure analysis does, but is still an effective tool for assigning group membership. We conducted the discriminant analysis using the added genet package in R. Goodness of fit was determined using a Bayes inference criteria, or BIC, resulting in K equals five clusters. 14 of 18 sources formed a single cluster with four other sources, each comprising a single distinct cluster. These group assignments were subsequently used to analyze sequence data as well as phenotypic data. Both seed sources obtained from the GRIN system clustered with the dominant group three. Unique clusters each comprised of a single seed source came from diverse seed source types with two sources from the Seed Savers Exchange Network, one from a small commercial seed company and one from a commercial farm in Maine. Out of these four sources, three were distributed under a distinct strain name, indicating that their stewards recognized they just diverged from a typical Jacobs cattle. So SNPs were distributed across all 11 chromosomes with some large distinct haplotype blocks present in a subset of assigned genetic groups. This figure plots minor alleles across all 11 chromosomes with assigned genetic group or cluster on the y-axis. Each mark represents a single genotype at a given locus. Blue mark marks denote a homozygous call of the minor allele, while red marks denote a heterozygous call. Because 14 of 18 seed sources had essentially the same genotype, Blue marks can be thought of as indicating locations at which a certain genotype differed from that, uh, that group of 14 highly homogeneous sources. In this way, we're treating the most common haplotype at a given locus as the reference genotype. So looking at the y-axis, we see our five assigned genetic clusters. Four of these clusters consist of a single seed source and are denoted by yellow, green, blue, and purple bars. Two sources display large haplotype blocks within the reference background, while two others show smaller areas of introgression. Interestingly, many of these novel haplotype blocks do not overlap between sources, suggesting the occurrence of unique outcrossing events in several sources. Here we zoom in to just those four divergent seed sources that comprise groups one, two, four, and five, and compare these data to our two Mesoamerican checks, a pinto and a black bean. We see substantial homology between some of these seed sources and middle American genotypes, leading to the conclusion that outcrossing possibly occurred between Jacob's cattle and a middle American genotype. Two sources in particular, groups four and groups five, show large introduced haplotype blocks, which are homologous to the middle American line, but not always with each other, suggesting potential outcrossing or um, subsequent divergent selection in multiple instances, or in separate instances rather. Because all sources maintained a seed phenotype associated with Jacob's cattle, this suggests that some selection occurred after this outcrossing event to regain a familiar seed phenotype. Alternatively, it's possible an intentional cross could have been made with subsequent selection following. And here we zoom in even further, comparing our four distinct groups with our two middle American checks along chromosome two only. And at this resolution, we can clearly see defined haplotype blocks um, denoted by the dotted lines that are homologous 
two are two middle American genotypes. In particular, we can see slightly more homology between the race Durango, which is our Pinto, and groups four and five, suggesting that perhaps the middle American genotype crossed with these sources was of race Durango. So the second part of this case study was to explore potential correlation between genotypic and phenotypic markers of diversity. This was explored using a field trial with an augmented design, including two replications and four blocks. Five seed sources were replicated in all four blocks, acting as checks. Traits measured were stem length, number of nodes on the main stem, number of pods per plant, yield per plant, and 100 seed weight. Measurements were taken on four randomly selected plants within each plot. At first glance, differences in seed phenotype were clearly apparent across seed sources that were all grown in the same field in the same season, indicating potential for genetic basis of the seed phenotypes. And when we match these photos to a discriminant analysis plot, we see that these phenotypic distinctions do seem to correlate to the genetic cluster, further supporting a genetic basis for phenotypic divergence. And diving into measured phenotypic traits, we also found significant differences in mean trait values between clusters. This was especially pronounced in 100 seed weight, but was also apparent in number of pods per plant. Interestingly, cluster four, which is the most genetically distinct cluster in our principal components analysis, show a shows a higher number of pods per plant and a lower 100 seed weight, both of which would be expected in genotypes with middle American ancestry. A second cluster, group five, also shows significantly lower seed weight. These two groups were also those that exhibited large haplotype blocks in our SNP distribution and were most genetically distinct from other seed sources. We also see significant differences in stem length. Again, group four shows longer stem length, which again is the expected phenotype for a middle American germplasm. One genetic group also had significantly lower yield than the other four groups, though reasons for that are unclear and uh, wider variance was also observed for this trait. Um, those results might be unsurprising given the complex nature and generally low heritability of plant yield compared to these other traits measured. So further supporting an association between phenotypic traits and genotype, we see a high correlation between 100 seed weight plotted here on the y-axis and principal component one of our principal component analysis of Jacob's cattle seed sources. For 100 seed weight and principal component one, the R squared value was 0.6. As you might remember from previous figures, values for PC1 were highly correlated to gen gen genetic ancestry with higher PC value, higher PC1 values associated with middle American genotypes. As mentioned before, also lower seed weight and smaller seed size is also closely linked to Middle American ancestry compared to Andean genotypes. This indicates that distinct seed sources likely represent a cross between Jacob's cattle and Middle American germplasm, and that some seed sources possess distinct phenotypic traits as the, the result of that crossing. Some correlation between other phenotypic traits and principal component one were, was observed, but with much lower R squared values, indicating a weaker causal link. So to summarize, very low diversity was observed within seed sources of Jacob's cattle, with the four individuals genotyped in each source tightly clustering with each other. This is meaningful in thinking about in-situ germplasm stewardship as each individual seed saver participating in this project 
would have had limited ability to adapt their population to a given environment due to low genetic variance, even over the span of 30 some years. We found that pooling multiple seed sources of Jacob's cattle revealed significant levels of genetic diversity. We hypothesized this diversity was driven by several, several separate incidents of accidental or intentional crossing between Jacob's cattle and another genotype, followed by selection or perhaps roguing to re regain elements of a Jacob's cattle-like phenotype. This is significant as an outcrossing event of this type would have increased genetic variance of the population being stewarded, allowing for selection and adaptation in that environment. Despite this, a majority of seed sources were highly related, indicating that many nodes within seed saver networks might have had a relatively recent common seed source. This is consistent with the relatively nascent history of seed saving networks in the United States states with groups such as seed savers acting as a central hub for traditional germplasm preservation and distribution. We also hypothesize that at least two separate instances of outcrossing of Jacob's cattle with a middle American genotype might have occurred. This is significant as admixture between gene pools is relatively uncommon in modern bean cultivars, except in the instances of disease uh, introgression of specific traits, such as perhaps disease resistance. Substantial genetic diversity was captured in sources from seed saving networks that would not have been captured by sourcing this variety from either a commercial seed source only or formal germplasm repositories. This further indicates that decentralized seed saving networks may, may offer an untapped source of genetic diversity and that trialing of heirloom varieties should take into account potential divergence of seed sources. And moving on, I will now <clears throat> drink some water <laughs> first and then discuss an applied breeding project to develop disease resistant specialty dry beans for regional food systems utilizing traditional varieties as a source of novel treats. So here in the Northeast, you may have noticed that we have regular precipitation in the summer and fall, and many of the agronomic traits prioritized for our region are related to that challenge. This includes a bush growth habit that is upright and holds pods off the ground. We're also challenged by a number of foliar bacterial and fungal diseases. Two of the most significant foliar pathogens are Xanthomonas campestris, Pathovar fasciolae, causal agent of common bacterial blight, and Caletotrichum lindemuthianum, causal agent of anthracnose, both of which can severely decrease yields and are transmitted via infestation or infection of seed. Bean common mosaic virus is less frequently transmitted from plant to plant in a field setting here in the Northeast but it is commonly transmitted in Western production region, regions by aphids, where large outbreaks can occur even with just a few infected plants initially. Since so much of our seed is produced in the West, and once a seed stock is infected with this virus, it is virtually impossible to eradicate. Uh, resistance to this pathogen remains a priority. So the first priority of the breeding project was to improve agronomic and disease resistance traits. The parent genotype that we chose based on preliminary trials and literature reviews, conferring improved disease resistance and other yield related traits such as plant architecture and maturity time was USDK CBB15, which is a USDA developed dark red kidney breeding line with good agronomic performance in our trials, resistance to common bacterial blight and being common mosaic virus, as well as two resistance alleles for anthracnose. CBB15 was developed via marker assisted selection for uh, disease resistance, but because this resistance is quantitative and only a small number of genetic markers have been identified, 
direct disease selection was also used to obtain a resistant breeding line with the two uh, resistance loci, SAP6 and SU91, as well as likely other minor resistance loci. Because common blight was the most problematic pathogen in our trial and breeding plots, and resistance to this disease is most complex, selection for resistance was the primary focus of phenotypic analysis. In contrast, resistance to BCMV is conferred, conferred by the I gene, which is an R gene conferring complete resistance under most production conditions in the Northeast. There are also several recessive alleles for resistance to BCMV, but these were not targeted in the current project and deployment is less widespread. In contrast, the I gene is present in nearly all modern cultiv cultivars, highlighting its importance. Um, but as this resistance allele originates in the middle American gene pool, it is unlikely that any traditional varieties of Andean origin um, that are common in the Northeast possess this allele. Resistance to anthracnose is typically characterized by race-specific qualitative resistance genes, and CBB15 is thought to possess the CO1 and CO2 loci. In developing a bean that is compelling to consumers and offers a high value for farmers, clearly setting the bean apart from commodity market classes is important. On the left, we see some examples of commodity market class beans and their seed coat colors and patterns. All of those classes have a dominant allele at the T locus, which gives them a solid color or pattern. On the right, you see some heirloom bean varieties that all have a partial white coloring over a colored or patterned background, which is conferred by a recessive T or TCF allele at the T locus. The figure in the middle outlines how that recessive allele interacts with some other seed coat genes to produce diverse white patterns on a self-colored background. So our two heirloom parent varieties were Calypso and Jacob's cattle, which were selected because they are already very widely grown across the United States relative to other traditional varieties and perform relatively well in the Northeast. All of these parents have a determinate bush habit and are presumed to be of Andean origin from the race Nueva Granada. As I alluded to, those strides have been made in improving resistance to bacterial blight. Current sources only confer partial resistance, and this is partic particularly challenging in Andean germplasm. So four linked genetic markers have been identified with 22 known major and minor effect loci. No resistance has been found in Andean germplasm, meaning that most heirloom beans of the Northeast and many modern kidney and cranberry cultivars are highly susceptible. CBB15 has two major resistance loci, as I mentioned, as well as my other minor resistance loci. In trials, CBB15 showed more resistance than a susceptible Andean check, but less than middle American sources, indicating the difficulty of bringing high levels of resistance from one gene pool to another. So we use marker-assisted pedigree selection with the goal of introducing disease resistance traits associated with higher yield and upright growth habit into Jacob's cattle and Calypso backgrounds using CBB15 as the donor parent. In the F2 through F4 generations, codominant SNP markers were used to screen seedlings for resistance loci, and those carrying one or more resistant alleles were grown to maturity to evaluate seed coat phenotype. In the F4 generation, bulk leaf samples from 34 families were genotyped rather than individual plants, with the goal of selecting whole families for advancement based on genotype and plot disease phenotype ratings. Within the context of this breeding project, we we're able to begin using high res resolution melt markers to screen progeny rather than gel-based methods, streamlining the process and allowing co-dominant genotyping for resistance loci. 
This technique entails the design of primers with GC rich tails of differing lengths that um, assign different contrasting melting temperatures to each allele at the locus of interest. Um, a simple PCR is first run with a dye, followed by a stepwise melting curve protocol on a real-time PCR. This results in a figure, as you see on the right, which clearly shows homozygous or heterozygous ileocalls based on contrasting melting temperature. We are very grateful to the Miklas Lab of the USDA for sharing this invaluable protocol with us. By the F4 generation in summer of 2020, we obtained 17 families with the desired partial colored seed coat and at least one resistance allele at each locus. Some examples of F4 seed coats show interesting divergence from parental phenotypes, the result of recombination between interacting seed coat genes. In 2020, we phenotyped full sieve progeny rows for disease incidence under natural bacterial blight pressure which we have easily obtained over both field seasons. Disease incidence was rated as a percentage of leaf area affected on a whole plot basis. On the left, you see parent genotypes with CBB15 showing much lower disease incidence. And on the right, you see F4 families binned by genotype. We see a wide range of likely susceptibility within pooled genotypes, which, is, which would be consistent with the complex nature of bacterial blight resistance and with past studies. We also see no additional resistance conferred by the sapsus 6 locus, indicating that our endemic bacterial blight strain may be a more vir virulent one. So moving into the F4, F, sorry, F5 generation, we can begin to select families based on direct disease screening rather than just genetic markers. So for example, we could replant families that exhibited disease incidence equal to or lower than our resistant parent um, the following season. Parent genotypes also diverge substantially in plant architecture, with CBB15 possessing larger plant size, greater plant height, greater number of pods per plant, and longer maturity time. Because Jacobs cattle and Calypso generally exhibit shorter maturity time than is needed for our region, we selected F4 families that exhibited architecture traits more similar to CBB15. Um, importantly, longer maturity time is often correlated to higher yields in common bean. So in summary, this breeding work, breeding project is definitely a work in progress. However, successful integration of several disease resistance loci, including the I gene for BCMV resistance, two loci for bacterial blight resistance, and the CO1 locus for anthracnose resistance was achieved. So continued selection for these alleles will, need, will be needed to achieve improved lines possessing all four resistance alleles. Direct disease screens under natural bacterial blight pressure highlighted the complexity of resistance to this pathogen. But some families promisingly show comparable resistance to the CBD parent. Future direct disease screens could be improved by using uniform inoculation trials rather than natural disease pressure, as within field variation in pathogen load um, may have contributed to substantial variation in phenotypes. One potential direction for this material would be a multi-line or mixture ap approach by bulking advanced lines that are fixer and rich for resistance alleles and have enough uniformity to be commercially viable while maintaining enough diversity um, to um, offer potential buffering effects in the face of environmental stress. As yield stability within pure cultivars is a major challenge, this would be a significant advantage. And as a concluding note, um, we recognize the complexity of working with traditional and indigenous bean varieties in the context of a university breeding program. And one reason for selecting traditional varieties that are already widely grown commercially was to respect longstanding ties between indigenous groups in the Northeast 
to be in varieties they have stewarded and selected over many centuries. For this reason, we chose not to use rare varieties that are still closely tied to indigenous stewardship. The use of indigenous germplasm to develop new intellectual property products is a complicated question and is one that I have personally grappled with to some degree during this project. And that's it. Uh, I would like to offer many thanks to my fellow lab members for all their help, my advisor, Michael, my committee, and other faculty who have shared advice and insights. I'm also very grateful to the public green dean reading community and their willingness to advise and share germplasm, especially Dr. Phil Nicholas, Tom Michaels, Hannah Sweegarden, Timothy Porch, Travis Parker, and Evan Wright. I'm also very indebted to the many growers, processors, and others who generously offer their time to letting me pick their brains about all things being related. I would also like to thank my funding sources through the USDA NIFA and Northeast SARE. That wraps it up. Thank you, Kristen, for that, that great seminar. Um, if, I don't know if anybody has any 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 questions uh, for, for Kristen? She'll have her the defense immediately following this, so her committee might not have many. But uh, I'd say you could either enter them in the chat, uh, or if you'd like to uh, unmute yourself and ask it directly, uh, people should have the the ability, or let us know in the chat. <clears throat> Just maybe to to kick things off, Kristen. So you you looked at. Um, I mean, Jacob's cattle is a collection that was in the northern U.S. I didn't see any below New York. Uh, could you elaborate on why you uh, had seemed to seem to have that latitude cut off? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I did try to um, find more sources in the southern part of the country, but um, I think there's probably various factors. I mean, certainly Jacob's cattle has strong cultural ties to New England, as I mentioned. It's a pretty short season variety. Um, and in general, Andean germplasm, which, of which it is one, um, tends to be better adapted to, in our country, more Northern regions, whereas we see more Middle American um, heirlooms, land races in Southern regions, particularly in the Southwest. So, and I think there's also fewer seed savers potentially, you know, there's a lot of seed saving networks in more northern parts of the country. So it's a little bit complicated, perhaps. Well, there's a, a question from uh, Ginny Moore in the chat. Ginny, would you like to ask it? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, I was just wondering um, kind of about the, um, if there's something unique about Jacob's cattle that makes it more diverse than other heirlooms, or if you would expect to see kind of a similar range of diversity um, if you screened you know, a similar number of sources of, of some other heirloom. Yeah, that's a great question. And initially, I should say that we intended to do this with two different heirlooms um, and then had like a surprise um, doubling of our genotyping costs after we made our budget. <laughs> so we did one. Um, but yes, I think Jacob's cattle um, probably is more likely to exhibit this pretty um, significant diversity between sources. Um, as I said, yeah, it's been cultivated. It's probably one of the most widely cultivated varieties, and I think that has a lot to do with it. And it does have more um, sort of varying strain names compared to others. Um, so something like a yellow eye, I, I bet would show similar um, divergence, but others that haven't been cultivated as wide, widely spread are probably much less diverse, so. So uh, Kristen, what's next with uh, these? The, the bean breeding line. So you you uh, you thought about you talked about them as a participatory program and kind of the next steps. But what do you see as their 
their future in the world? Who do you see wanting to, to grow them or how will they uh, distribute, market them? How will they appear to the public? Home gardener, packaged? I mean, I think it depends on where we end up with it, right? <laughs> I hope um, they um, are productive enough to um, to serve a commercial market. There's, um, as I said, I you know also did a lot of just sort of talking with people in the supply chain of regional um, grains and related staple crops, and there there really is quite a lot of consumer excitement around um, specialty traditional varieties. Um, and so I think there's, if, you know, if we're able to have a, a good source of seed um, and a, a, you know, a good performing variety for commercial farm, I think there definitely is a market for um, commercial production outside of the predominant market classes. And then uh, Ellie very appropriately wonders about flavor and taste. You see it there in the chat? If you yeah. Them. Yeah. 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 Flavor and bean, I feel like it's this somewhat controversial thing. And I think, um, I mean, definitely it would make sense to evaluate flavor. And I think, you know, in the, we were limited by small seed quantity and the generations that we, you know, got through so far, but definitely once we had um, the ability to have larger plots and potentially grow the beans in different locations, um, doing a tasting panel would, would be highly recommended for sure. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, I guess where I land on that is I think often these varieties have different culinary uses rather than like certain ones being like so delicious and others being gross. Um, they sort of like are more suited for different culinary applications. Cool. And I think there's uh, probably time for one more question, I think, from uh, Courtney. Uh, maybe I might paraphrase. So, how might you? imagine this extending to other seed networks or what can you envision uh going on in other seed saving networks in terms of diversity kind of based yeah. on what you saw yeah i mean i see bean as being sort of like if diversity exists here it probably exists everywhere because bean is a highly self-pollinating crop and like i mentioned these seed saver networks i mean this is sort of just a, an anecdotal thing but with these large seeded crops, you know, tiny amounts of seed are shared between these networks, you know, you'll maybe pass on five seeds. And so it really discourages maintenance of diversity. So, um, and I mean, definitely other people have done work in other crops, um, for example, wheat, um, and it would be pretty different with a cross pollinating crop, but definitely you would ex expect to see, you know, increased diversity, I would expect. So yeah, and Sandra asked, um, out of all the beautiful beans, how did you choose to work with Jacob's cattle specifically? And that was um, in part due to the sort of widespread cultivation of it and that we were working with it in our breeding program certainly played a role. Um, also, you know, I'd formed collaborations with um, seed savers, um, including Heron Breen, who I somehow left out of my slide, which is horrible, um, who is very embedded in the main seed saving networks and, and sort of um, helped to, to dream up that project. So um, it just sort of seemed like a good, a good starting point for exploring that story, that there might be a story there with Jacob's cattle. Cool. Right. Thanks for that. All those great, great questions. Uh, it's a great way to follow up. And I think, uh, I think, well, thank you again, Kristen, for this uh, uh, sharing all your, your research with us. Yep. And um, I think, uh, and if anybody wants to follow up, I think you all know where to find uh, to find Kristen uh, for some more questions. I think she'll stay uh, in the area uh, for a bit, at least. So, um, yeah. So I think we'll move on to Kristen's uh, 
uh, defense uh, after this, but just uh, yeah, thank you all for coming to uh, and uh, uh, Kristen, great job. Thanks all, thanks for coming. Good to see you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.